<laughs> Just <Okay>. smile. <laughs> Recording. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Church of the Larger Fellowships, The View. I'm Christina Rivera, and uh, we welcome you to today's episode where we're going to be talking about um, the spirituality around pronoun usage and a lot, all things um, non-binary and trans. So we're, we're going to have a really great show, and we're excited to be here. Um, we do uh, have a bunch of our regular hosts who are on the road doing other things today. So Meg Riley, Aisha Hauser, and Michael Tino are not available to join us today. Um, but we are thrilled uh, that Charluca Herman de la Fuente is going to be with us as a co-host. And Antonia Veldegado uh, is coming out from behind the chalice where she usually is um, to uh, help us out as uh, with hosting uh, duties. Um, I am coming to you from uh, beautiful today, Charlottesville, Virginia, where the weather is finally cooperating and uh, getting us into fall, which everybody here is very, very excited about. Julika, tell us where you are. Good morning, everyone. I am in Williamston, Michigan, just outside of Lansing. Here in Michigan, we point to our hands to say where we are. We're, I'm right here. And I'm super excited to be co-hosting today and to be a part of this conversation. And Antonia, tell us where, you, where you're up to. Hi, I'm Antonia Baldelgado. My pronouns are Z and Zer. And I am in Wilmington, Delaware on a nice fall day. It's good to be home. It's coldish. Sorry. <laughs> well, usually um, this time on the view, we do um, a little bit of a UU roundup. And um, so I'll invite Julika and Antonia if you know of anything that's been going on out in UU land that you'd like to, um, to highlight. I'll um, just mention that um, I know that there was a lot of UU presence um, in DC and in lots of other areas this week um, with the Supreme Court hearing a case uh, regarding LGBTQ um, rights. And it was just really, I, I felt really good knowing that in so many different places, um, Unitarian Universalists were um, coming out to um, really uh, insists that that our human dignity is being um, being valued and being uh, represented um, as the Supreme Court, um, you know, tries to decide whether or not they're going to um, um, show us what their human dignity looks like, um, because it's really about um, we we know our dignity and our value and our worth. Um, and it's really about what they're going to show us and not theirs. So, um, Julika and Tony, do you guys have anything Roundup-ish? That's what most of what I was tracking as well, Chris, um, on Facebook and in conversations. I will also name that I am currently serving as the UU Ministers Association intern. And so I am focusing, yay, it's awesome. And I'm focusing a lot on ministerial support and things like that. And so in the, in the world of ministers, this is the season of fall gatherings, clusters, and chapters come together. And this year is particularly exciting because we are 
um, considering revisions to our guidelines. So I have been in that, in that more narrow place of the UU world, very involved in that conversation and very excited for it. So I'm shouting out to all of the ministers who are taking the lead in leading conversations with other colleagues. I think it's a really, really important piece of our work and I'm really grateful to you. Thank you for that work. And that's it. Like I, I, to me, the energy around the Supreme Court stuff was pretty heavy. Like there was a lot and I found myself pushing out and, and, and doing a little more Facebook filtering than I usually do and getting on, checking my groups and getting right out. Like I, I, this was not a good week for the feed for me. Um, there was there was too much going on. I, I identify as queer and so do my two daughters and that's something that is um, so very, 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 very personal and I need to do the resilience work of limiting things sometimes. So that's where I was. How about you, Antonia? Did you, anything else that you were um, tracking this week? Um, a little bit further out, I'm really um, excited that my, my church uh, that I'm interning at uh, shout out to Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. Um, we are having a gender justice retreat, which when I started, it was called the uh, Women's Leader Retreat. And I just was like, I'm sorry, I can't go, not a woman. And they heard that and they looked at what they were trying to do and they fixed it because what they were really looking for was gender justice. And so I'm really excited about that. That's happening tomorrow and um, through the weekend. And so I'm excited about that. And um, this is my first year being an intern um, minister. And I'm really excited that the UUMA saw fit to provide um, a retreat for uh, UU interns of color and their, um, and their supervisors. I'm gonna be there too. We're gonna be in Chicago together. Yay! <laughs> and so I'm really excited about that too. It seems often that there are things that I can talk about about my erasure in this in this um, faith, and I feel like I've been seen for a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court, I was in a dark place. I was in a dark place with that. And um, thank goodness for me being a, a fellow at the larger fellowship because we have um, theological reflection with our um, ministers there. So we were able to work on some resiliency in some ways to pack our tool belts as uh, ministers and seminarians to bolster ourselves and get out there in the good fight. So that's where I am right now. And I'm really excited for Shige to be here and to talk about the things that we're gonna talk about because I think there are a lot of people who want to learn and just don't even know where to begin. And so I'm so excited that you said yes, Shige. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that that brings us right into um, our guest and we are thrilled uh, that Shige Sokura said yes <laughs> when we reached out. Um, so I'm just going to uh, tell the folks out there in Uland a little bit about you and uh, directly from your bio, and then uh, we'd love to hear, um, you know, you expand on that and tell us a little bit more. Um, so uh, Shige Sakurai is the founder of the International Pronouns Day, which takes place this year, uh, or all years, on the third Wednesday of October. This year, that makes it October 16th, which is coming up. Um, he, they are also the author of mapipronouns.org and the first person to receive an officially non-binary driver's license in the United States. Whoop, whoop, that's awesome. They are the Director of Leadership Initiatives and Associate Director of the LGBT Equity Center at the University of Maryland College Park. Shige is a Unitarian Universalist and has atheist, Shinto, Buddhist, and uh, Christian heritages. They have written and spoken about queerness and Shinto and nature spiritualities. Shige has traveled to in over 40 countries, studying in six of them. Definitely want to hear about that. And they live in Washington, D.C., just a little bit up the road from where I am. So welcome. Thank you so much for um, coming on with you. 
Um, and just like tell it that was like a lot in your bio packed into just a little bit. Um, so feel free to pick out any one of those those and tell us a little bit more. Sure. Hi, Shige. Uh, they, them pronouns. It's so great to be on The View with you today. I'm excited to have this conversation. Um, I'm not sure quite where to begin, um, for maybe with like non-binary and trans identities. Um, I, I don't know how much folks um, in their own spaces are engaging with some of these conversations. I know some people definitely are, obviously, with the Supreme Court um, discussing trans uh, lives really in a direct way for the first time um, is is huge. And, and I haven't read all the details, but I'm hearing how they're getting stuck on restroom issues or things like that, that um, can, for those of us that have been doing this work in these spaces for decades, um, it can really just be like, I thought that we talked about this already. And of course, like for many people, in the US, uh, in countries around the world, they haven't talked about this yet, even though we've been talking about it for years and years and years. Um, when I think about like terms like non-binary, right, some of this may be fairly new for people. And in many ways, like this is new in terms of a term that we've popularized in the last eight years or so. Um, but like these identities have existed, you know, since time immemorial. And, and for me, finding my place as a non-binary, trans, agender, gender variant person, gender queer person who has used various terms to describe myself over the years, um, it, it feels like more and more each year I feel like I'm coming more to find home for myself. And some of that is in language and in terminologies that um, are meant to embrace, meant to find community, meant to assert um, politically, the rights that we should have, that we can come together around some of these terms as ways to advocate. Um, but for me, it's like I've needed to, sure, I've been like out in some ways gender variant for almost two decades, but um, at the same time, how do I find community? How do I come together? And how do I find that in my heritage and who that I am in my spirituality? And so for me over the last years, it's really been, um, although I have these different spiritual backgrounds, um, I think a few at the forefront for me right now are probably um, UU spaces as well as Shinto and um, European modern pagan traditions and Druidry and trying to find um, myself within some of these spaces. And that can always be a struggle, especially in sort of the world of actually having to deal with people <laughs> um, and very real things that happen. But um, I find myself constantly when I think about the ancestors, when I think about nature, when I think about history. And um, one of the things that I found as I was trying to explore Shinto more and more was um, in the Kojiki, which was the oldest extant text um, describing Shinto and the history, mythological and, and very real, of Japan, um, that the first deities that appear out of nowhere um, are described using genderless words. Um, and that even um, commentators later talked about how maybe they were queer because they were like, there was more reproduction or production of deities that happened um, in either genderless ways or in ways that were later thought maybe that the, those original deities were all masculine. Um, and so what does that mean? So there's a lot of different interpretations. Um, but for me, I see a lot of people in spiritual spaces that um, if they um, claim or believe in certain deities or find that important to them, they're seeing more ways that that also might be genderless or transcend a binary of gender. Um, and we know from many traditions, um, from like Talmudic sources, that there are uh, many different ideas of sex and gender. It is not just two. Um, and so this sort of spans lots of different traditions. And so for me, it's been more recently um, thinking a lot more explicitly about pronouns um, and the way that like names and pronouns are really critical um, to how that we respect and support each other. Um, and that that comes through spiritual spaces, through secular spaces, um, but that 
that is for me increasingly important. Um, but to me, I just don't want to lose track that there's a lineage to all of this, that it didn't just appear out of thin air, even though some terms may be new or that we're now talking about them more, or you know, the, for the first time, the Supreme Court is really having a conversation and probably a very scary one. Um, but that there is a history and a lineage. I've been in spaces where we share our pronouns for about 19 years now. And some people say, well, I've never done this before. And I'm like, cool, we'll try to get there and, and, and help you figure out how to do this and be more comfortable. But, um, you know, please understand that for me, this is not new and this has been more than, you know, I'm 38 years old. It's been more than half of my life that I've been in spaces where we share our pronouns. So I'm kind of like also get with the program um, and, uh, and sort of how do we um, not just conceptualize this as like something that young people came up with two years ago. Um, this is something that we've been in discussion about, especially in trans um, identified spaces for many, many years. Yeah, and I think that's super important um, to, to let folks know that, you know, we, we often talk about meeting people where they are in our faith. Um, and I think that while it's important to meet people where they are, it's also important to know that that doesn't mean that we have to pretend that that's where everyone is or where everyone was, right? And so I, I really liked what you said when you were saying it, that it, it felt like when you're using those, those proper pronouns for yourself, that it felt like coming home, right? And, and so part of that is, that, like you said, having you know, been doing this for as long as, as you've been doing and other people have been doing. And, and so it's great to meet people where they are in terms of you know, talking to them about um, the gender spectrum and non-binary and, and all of that, but that doesn't mean that we have to negate that people have been, that this has been, you know, centuries worth of, of, uh, of exploration and, and not even exploration, just like the norm, right? Um, so often we, we kind of frame this as, you know, new and, and but as you said, well, actually it, it is kind of the norm in, in uh, a lot of ways. And getting people to that is um, is super important. So I'm really glad that, that you talked about that. Um, and particularly as it relates to um, the Shinto religion, um, so many of us in uh, marginalized communities have um, really direct cultures that really talk about our direct contact to our ancestors. And I've always, loved the Shinto religion's um, direct call to that um, without, so, so often the ancestors, the way I experience it um, kind of gets in white culture UU, it gets, it's kind of almost exoticized, right? And to me, it's just like, no, this is just everyday life. Um, and so being able to say, you know, and it's not just our, our faith and our faith tradition that does that, there's others that do it, um, really, uh, is helpful. And, and so I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, and I think that that's, um, you know, it's a challenging area because I don't want to just romanticize history and, and think that like my interpretation is equal to the interpretation that people would have had um, a thousand years ago either. Um, there are many like terrible things that have happened in history and there are many terrible ancestors too. And so I think there's a way in my mind at least to have that reverence in the same way that we think about, um, you know, the first principle or interconnectedness and kind of, um, you know, the interconnectedness is not just of like living um, and, and the current existence world, but it is also the world that came before and it is the world that is to come and that to see that we are connected in that way is what's important to me about that. Um, and then recognizing, um, you know, there, there, but there have been like different versions of trans people or multiple, more than two genders in many different cultures in many parts of the world and over a long period of time also doesn't say that we were always like supported in every space or 
felt empowered in different ways. Um, and I think we always have to seek more justice, no matter, no matter what, no matter when. I would love to follow up on, on something along those lines, Shige. But before I do, I just want to notice something that I noticed in us, in our process today. And that is that when you are watching this live uh, Facebook, hello people, you can see that we have all identified our pronouns. But when we introduced ourselves verbally, it was Antonia and Shige who used their pronouns and Chris and I did not. And we, um, I identify as cisgender. You do too, right, Chris? So I, I think that that's just really worth naming that when we give the heavy lifting to the folks who are not using she, her, him, his, the he, him, whatever, um, that, that, that that is a way that we who are cisgender allies can work to normalize it and, and do it more. So I apologize to you for not doing that verbally as well, particularly for folks who are listening to this recording later and only have the audio and don't see that I identify as she or her on the video. So I just wanted to name that as a practice that, that we tried to do and that I failed in this moment. I apologize. Um, I, I'm really struck by this idea of the, the navigating the cultural piece of how we do this work because I personally, when I came out of the closet as bisexual, which is sort of parallel, not the same, but um, I had to leave part of my Mexican culture and heritage during a phase in which I didn't feel safe coming out to my family. I didn't feel safe living in Mexico. I actually came to the, to the United States, came out of the closet, went home and said nope, and came back to the United States in great part because I had come out of the closet and that did not feel like it was a welcome thing in Mexico. So I appreciate you naming, Shige, that we don't always do a good job around both gender expression and queerness. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to heal my own personal relationship to my heritage. And in particular, my challenge with Spanish is that so many of the words are gendered, male, female. And I'm trying training myself to use X or to use E instead of A or O. And it's not easy. It's, it's harder for me in Spanish than it is in English to honor my commitment to be more inclusive around gender expression and gender identity. I wonder, you, you speak several languages? Is that right? Chica? Uh, mostly, in, mostly English. Okay. Um, I, I speak some Spanish. Okay. Um, and I and have learned a little bit of other languages, but primarily Spanish is my second. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if you want to say anything else about the, the, the different experiences, or if not in other languages, because you've been in 40 countries, like what have you learned and what have you noticed about the different <clears throat> cultural ways we navigate this um, inclusivity? Yeah, I mean, I think um, pronouns, uh, whether they are gendered or not, is it varies based on language because there are gender neutral languages uh, in terms of pronouns. Um, but many languages, and you, you brought up Spanish as one example, um, languages that not only gender personal pronouns for an, referring to an individual, but also um, may gender all kinds of words. Um, and particularly when they then refer to specific human beings, it becomes more um, challenging in that context. Um, and, and I think you brought up the X or the E, um, usually pron pronounced like a Spanish E, um, either way, um, that, um, that there are constructs people have, have been working on and developing in like queer activist spaces. Um, and I've seen that, um, as far back as 2014, um, when I met with like queer um, youth activists in Mexico City, they were using the X. Um, and a lot of people in the US will say Latinx or, or something like that. But of course, like for many people living in Latin America, like Latinx is not necessarily an identity. It's a sort of US identity. Um, but yes, like integrating the X or the E uh, into all of these different constructs and figuring out kind of like, well, when does this make sense? Well, when I'm referring to a specific person 
or when I'm using an adjective to describe a specific person, um, if I don't know their gender, or if they are non-binary and they've said that I want to go in these more gender neutral ways. Um, so just there's lots of context where I see it coming up. But of course, that's more things to do um, than, than just pronouns. Um, and it's a struggle for some folks. Um, and in French, I think similarly, there's a bit of a struggle to, um, again, it's sort of you're developing more than just like what's the pronoun, but you're thinking about language more broadly. Um, one article I saw was in Canada, though, describing health care for trans people and how there were francophones or people living in francophone areas that were going to anglophone providers because it was easier for non-binary people that went by gender neutral pronouns and language to feel included and respected. And so it was really interesting to me just to think about like what the impact is on people when they don't feel included and that they're like willing to drive hours to find a medical provider that will even just use the right pronouns. And of course, language and which language we're talking about presents its own challenges. Um, and I will also mention there, are, beyond all that, there's so much diversity of languages. I've seen, um, you know, there are other examples of, for example, um, and I don't remember the name of it, there is one culture where men and women speak different languages, literally. Um, there's also, you know, in Thai language, people usually reference themselves at the end of a sentence, and it is a gendered reference. Um, and there are um, trans folks or um, uh, folks who maybe are a different gender than men or women who um, have their own endings that they use um, in some of these sentences. And there are also examples of cultures where trans people have their own language um, as well. So lots of language diversity. Yeah. I wanted to talk to talk about the Latinx um, term because I think I was reading Medium yesterday and there's this also the other side saying, you know, don't water down our language or don't don't change the language to change, you know, to force like this hipster thing or and then there are, are some issues around culture and language that it discussed. So I I'm like, should I, shouldn't I? Do I keep the X? Should I just use the E? How do I use the E? And it's pretty sad because I'm someone <laughs> who is, I'm, I'm pretty aware. I, I often, and I have been using, using Latinx for a couple of years. And so now I'm, I'm feeling like, man, have I just totally disrespected a whole culture of people by using this X, trying to be inclusive. And now I've actually just, screwed up somebody else's language. So I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, that article prompted a lot of thinking and uh, processing for me because if you if you look at the way that Latin American people have been identified in the United States, I have for a very long time preferred Latinx over Hispanic because Hispanic references Spain, which is the colonizing country, right? So for me, Latinx was better. Then I read this article. Actually, Latinx was something that referenced a French um, imperialist attempt, something, something. And actually, that is also colonialist and imperialist. And I'm like, well, wonderful. Thank you very much. But I, and, and the other piece about that was that um, it was written from the perspective of, of a Chicano Chicana historical experience. And the Chicano Chicana lived experience is specific to a Texan life and, and place. And the, that author feels like making it hip um, takes away from some of the history. I respectfully disagree with that author. I am not Chicana and I, um, and I identify as a Mexican immigrant because that's what I am, but I want everyone to be included in, in our experience. And I do think that if we can say Chicanex or Chicane, I, I don't think that that's being hip. I think that that's being, that I think for me, that's like when we know better, we do better. And if they didn't do it before, it's because they didn't know. But now we know, and so now we do it. That is my personal experience. 
what are you thinking around all of this, Chris, as the other Latinx person in the room? <laughs> so I do identify as, as Chicana. Um, and I think that, and I'm from Southern California, and there's a, a large uh, Chicano population in, in Southern California, in Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, and I think that when I read that article, which was, while it brought to light some interesting things to talk about, it was horribly written and it was very, and, and horribly written in terms of it was, um, it was insulting and harmful to people who were not on the he, she gender binary. Um, and, in, and that to me is the conversation, right? That gets hidden in the conversation about, you know, is it X, is it E, is it, you know, how do we change our language? Because that's the conversation I wanna have about that article is that that was masquerading, um, you know, some, some real anti-queer, anti-trans, um, you know, really problematic um, culture in masked in this conversation about how we should change the language. And I think that, you know, I, I absolutely want to have, you know, the conversation about language, but I don't want to have it at the expense of pointing out that, that it's really about people who don't, who are actively anti-trans, anti-queer. Um, and that, you know, ha we, we have to name that, and we have to name that within our cultures, and we certainly have it within the Latinx culture. Um, it, you know, that's the part of the culture that we really need to be talking about. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, the Latinx, Chicanx, um, I, I definitely, you know, I, I kind of agree with, I think, something Chige said, a little bit earlier was, you know, when I'm talking about a particular person um, and I know, you know, how they identified, I change the language according to that. I don't necessarily change it for, you know, just in general. So I call myself Chicana. I don't call myself Chicana because I know how I identify. Um, but I do talk about Latinx, you know, when I'm talking about the, the, um, or I try to, <laughs> when I'm talking about the population in general. Um, but I think that, you know, it, it kind of goes back to Shige, what you were saying earlier about, you know, we start talking about the bathrooms, right? Um, and, and we're like, wow, didn't we already have that conversation? And it's because we're having, yeah, we're having that bathroom conversation. We're not having the conversation about the actual, um, the actual issue, which is, you know, people being afraid um, and, and sometimes not, not even just afraid, but actually anti, um, anti-queer and anti-trans. Um, and so that's, that's the harder conversation to have, right? Of, we, we can make the language whatever we want to make the language, but if people still aren't supporting the idea of somebody having a different gender identity, then does it really matter? And I think that this goes back to the point that Julica was making around, you know, who, well, part of it is whose burden is it to do some of this, but also um, whose voices are we centering is the other paired question with that, I think. And I have, I've seen the headline, but I haven't read this most recent article, but I've seen a number of critique articles trying to basically say that uh, Latinx is an Anglophone invention, which I'm I'm not convinced of that being factually true. Um, but um, sure, okay, it, people don't have to like it. I do wonder though what non-binary people that are native Spanish speakers have to say about that, because most of the articles I'm seeing are not um, from that community that would be most affected. It is people that are mad about having to change and that are using that there's a colonialist thing happening as their rationale for why that they shouldn't have to change. Um, and I would say I do see people using Latinx, um, but then I also see people doing Latinx slash A slash O. 
so that there are more options. And, and, and I understand that like not ever, you know, there may be good reason to provide more options, right? But at the end of the day, I'm just sitting here going, but what about the people that are most affected? Who, what do those folks have to say? Because that's not necessarily the voices that I'm seeing lifted up in these critique pieces. Kiana Perkins, oh, Kiana Perkins is one of our, um, I want to say listeners, followers, viewers, viewers. And Kiana says, in the greater queer community, I've been experiencing backlash related to pronoun sharing. People who don't want to share feel the need, people who don't want to share or feel the need to share. There are layers to this stance. As we navigate that, how do we invite folks to share in ways that validate without inviting them in any harm into the space? So if anybody can answer that. I'm wondering if other people see that showing up in your spaces and, and specifically how that you see that showing up. What are the things that people um, are saying that either are the backlash or what does the inviting harm look like in your spaces? I think, um, so I'm in a lot of youth ministry spaces and I think it's a little bit different there. Um, maybe not, but I think that when we're talking about this, this issue, we're usually talking about um, how can we support people who are um, in discernment and questioning um, their gender identity and so they may not know what to say when you know you sit around in a circle and everybody shares their um, their pronoun um, and so where the question I get then is actually a very supportive question of you know are we doing harm by sitting in the circle and everybody giving their pronoun when it gets to that one person who's like, you know, deer in the headlights um, kind of thing. And, and so how, how can we create an environment in which that person feels safe and, and knowing that they don't have to share or um, that. So I think there's that question. And then sometimes we find it in other ways in which people, like you said, are just, you know, at, being asked to change and are push, trying to push back against the change. Um, but my, my concern is really that first one of, you know, how, how do we support folks who, who just don't know yet and don't have language for not knowing yet. Mm -hmm. I see it um, in congregations, especially in the, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm 43, so around my age group and older, I see a almost like type of thing my pronouns are how do you do it again and i find it extremely dismissive but because generally they're cisgender people so it's it's not hard they're the pronouns you've had your whole life you know so so i find that to be um a little annoying and also a little not a little a lot othering it if the collective of people are doing that, it's, it's a way to say, I don't want to talk about this. And I don't, I don't feel like you need to say this. Um, I find with the youth that I have worked with, generally there's a, it just rattles off with them, but there is, I wanna speak to what Christina said. There is, there is a place where people are still sorting it out that it makes it uncomfortable in the room. What I generally say is you may choose to share your pronouns or not, or if you're still sorting out your pronouns, please know that if your pronoun is they, them today and she, her tomorrow, your pronouns, all of your pronouns are valid here. So that's kind of how I, I sort it through. But yes, there, there is that we're bothering you to talk about pronouns in, in my generation and over is what I've experienced. I've also experienced um, what you're describing, Antonia. I would label it as cis fragility. Like, oh no, I can't, you can't make me do things differently. I have a situation I'm currently working with that is not specific to the queer community, as Kiana, Kiana was saying, but, um, but is a, a women's choir who, and, and this group of people want to identify as women and sing women's music and 
you know, when invited to consider what about non-binary people? What about trans people? What are you welcoming? They, I, I see them navigating this yes, but. So there's this, we welcome everyone however you identify, and we're going to still elevate womanhood in a way that makes me a little squiggly. And I'm, I'm and, and they've invited me to support them in that process. And I, I think I'm going to need some support in order to support them um, and to find the way to journey through that conversation. And I, and I think some of that resistance is about surviving toxic masculinity and patriarchy and i get that like i do get that it's important to continue to fight patriarchy and to fight toxic masculinity but i don't think we have to be exclusive or binary in when we do that and that's what i'm trying to find ways i i welcome any thoughts that you have shige around that or around anything else that we've said so far what are you thinking I mean, I think that that specific issue is probably its own complicated conversation um, because a part of it is it depends on what you're trying to do with that group. Um, but I do see constructs that people are working on where they're talking about um, either women or men and maybe folks that identify as adjacent to or non-binary with some of those communities. I also see in like choral spaces, sometimes people saying treble voices or some other way of, of looking at what the purpose of the group is, but it kind of depends on what part of the purpose of the group is. Um, I think like what struck me about the, the question we were asked was also that it was really about the greater queer community um, and not just cis people um, being resistant to um, or having some backlash around pronoun sharing. Um, I totally get the point about um, this feeling of like people feeling like they're outed or needing to share um, something that they're not ready to share, especially for trans people. Again, I want to like wonder, you know, when and are trans and non-binary voices being centered um, as some of those concerns come up, because sometimes it is a lot of concern trolling that I see um, around um, these issues. I'm not saying any of you are all are, are doing that or other people in the group are, but it may be happening. Um, and I sometimes see um, that as a reason to almost not have the conversation rather than to say, yes, that might be a concern. And here's what we can do to think about that more critically. And I think that so as we thought about so a couple things, um, I made the website mypronouns.org as a way to take some of the burden off of trans and non-binary people for us to have to explain and re-explain the same thing over and over and over again and to provide more online information that people could just go and say, look at this website or here's a link. I have a bunch of links on that website that are for people to, um, to be able to share um, their own pronouns and an explanation as to why that they're sharing them. Um, so I just wanted to simplify that. I know it's not like a perfect solution, um, but it's an additional resource that I wanted to have because I was exhausted um, and wanting to figure out like, how do I educate or bring in more allies without having to repeat myself and answer tough questions verbally, constantly, emotionally, mentally, uh, and put it into like a more fixed format. It's a beautiful um, website. It's like thank phenomenal. You. Thank you for your work. Yeah. Thank, thank you. And and I think that like the other thing that I'm I'm you know the other reason then that I founded International Pronouns Day and we've got a whole bunch of like board members, volunteers, all kinds of people that have gotten excited about um, we should be talking about pronouns more. Um, is is again that I see it as a vehicle for especially people that want to be allies to educate themselves and to take on some more of that labor. So it's not just another visibility and awareness day where trans people have to expose themselves and explain themselves and defend themselves, um, but that we have more opportunities for um, people that want to be allies to work on that. 
And as we thought about our mission statement for what the purpose of Pronouns Day is, we said that we wanted to make respecting, um, sharing, and educating about pronouns more commonplace. Um, as we originally did that, the words were in a slightly different order, and we had said asking about pronouns, and we're not against people asking people what people's pronouns are, but we wanted to substitute in educating about because we felt that simply doing the pronouns go around where you just ask people, but they have no context. They don't understand why they're being asked. They don't understand how to share. Um, we felt it was important to really emphasize the educational aspect and to put the respecting first before sharing, before then educating or asking people about their pronouns. Um, and so um, part of the point of um, resources you can find both through Pronouns Day and through um, mypronouns.org uh, is that you can find examples of how could you um, introduce the topic um, rather than just say, everybody just share your name and pronouns. Well, if people don't know why you're doing that or that you can opt out, that you don't have to share your pronouns, that if you don't know somebody's pronouns, you could just use that person's name. For many people, they, them, as sort of a, I don't really know your pronouns yet is usually okay. Um, but there are lots of other options, right? Um, and so just trying to like educate about that, I think has really prevented some of the, the harm. Um, and, and I know that that's a lot for somebody that's new to the, to the topic to just start doing. And so that's why I think there's scaffolding, right? I think that you have to start with how do you respect pronouns, practicing that, getting that kind of thinking about that some more. And the other thing is when there is backlash, like I'm not personally, I'm not most focused on, I am focused on the harm that's being caused by some of that, but I'm not most focused on like, let me get you everyone to be right uh, in the way that I would want them to be. I think that it's cultural shift. And I think that in order to do that, it's really about the people that want to make it happen um, more than the, than like debating the people that don't care couldn't be bothered or actively hate. Um, because I think that like, that's not, although there's a lot of work to do in that space, a lot of people come along because they see something being supported, normalized, or they start to have empathy because they actually know people. And we've seen this, I think, for LGBT issues generally, not just for um, trans non-binary, but there's a lot of research that when you know somebody, when you've heard their story, you develop empathy and you start to support the issues and causes that matter to them because you realize um, how it's impacting people and how it even impacts you. Um, and so I see lots of reasons why, even though some of us are saying, please, you know, think about pronouns, think about more places where you could share your pronouns optionally, but, um, you know, respect this. And then people resist, but part of the thing is like, we haven't even really talked about trans and non-binary issues all that much. We are, we are, I mean, it is, I think an entry point. You know, I think that like basic respect of like, who are you, what is your name? How do you wanna be referred to by is an entry point to very real conversations we do need to have about restrooms. Because like, it's not just about, I should be able to use the restroom according to my gender identity, it's also about we don't have enough all gender restrooms. And there's a lot of things we have to do procedurally, regulatory, like financially, operationally, logistically to like create different spaces to think what would a universal design that supports um, nursing parents or um, people uh, with disabilities or trans non-binary folks, what would a real universal design for a restroom look like and how do we make that so that every time we build new structures we're building in a thoughtful way we're not even there yet so yes pronouns but it's a way to then start talking about trans people to talk about violence to talk about all these issues that we face okay. um i don't know the term uh concern trolling can you tell me what that means i have an idea but i want to make sure i <laughs> i understand it I mean, I think it's when you, when, I don't even know if people intend it in their minds that it's all plot, plotted out, but I think when people raise concerns, not really because we really have to talk about that concern to move forward, but it's a way to stop a conversation. 
Um, it can, it, you know, in function, it can be a tool um, that's sort of a conversation ender. Um, I, I'm thinking that this, I mean, this isn't just about like pronouns or trans issues. I mean, I think this comes up in all kinds of areas. It's almost like slippery slope arguments um, where people say, well, then what about this? And I think that is sort of what we're seeing in the Supreme Court is, um, you know, you want to talk about like not being fired from your job, but if we allow you to not be fired from your job, then what does that mean about restrooms? And it becomes this whole, like we have to discuss every single issue and can't just move forward because we see something that's like more fundamentally the underlying issue. Um, some of it is probably, there's some concerns that are I think more uh, meaningful than others and legitimate, but I also think sometimes people bring things up just to divert the conversation. Um, Jilika has a question um, from the audience, and then I want to hear a little bit more before we run out of time. I definitely want to hear about um, the International Front End Day because it's coming up. Thank you. Yes, I hear from Linnea Nelson, the president of the Loretta Board, our religious educators, and um, she can't post on Facebook. She doesn't know why. So she, she messaged me instead. I wanted to react to your comment of we know better when we do better. When we know better, we do better. To that goal, Loretta is following the administrator and membership professional associations in partnering with Transforming Hearts Collective to offer a six hour online program with live Q&A sessions for Loretta members starting in January, launching this initiative very soon. Hopefully educating religious educators will permeate our congregations and the greater world in understanding and more supportive relationships. That is super exciting. I look forward to that online Transforming Hearts Collective session. I've heard it's really fabulous from other folks already. That's great. Thank you, Linnea. So Shige, what can you tell us about the upcoming International Permanente Day? Like, why did you create it? Um, and kudos for that, yay. Um, and what would you like us to be doing with it? Yeah, so, um, it's coming up, it's the third Wednesday of uh, October this year, it's the 16th, so it will be different dates each year based on, on the calendar. Um, so that is less than one week away, um, but there's lots of ways that people can, can utilize that day and that space to kind of create education, to learn more about the issues. If for folks, they feel like this is really new, I have not thought about this at all, um, it may just be an opportunity to read some things and see what people are, are saying. Of course, there's always going to be some like transphobic thing that people want to say, um, but like take a look at what trans people have to say. And, and, you know, pronouns are not everyone's number one issue. To me, though, I see them as an entry point to having a conversation about um, intersectional identities, about the violence that people are facing, about discrimination, um, about restrooms and the access that we need to have and improve. Um, so I think that like it could be, to me it's that thinking of like what does basic respect and dignity look like? Um, for those that are like, I know some more, I know how this works, I'd like to educate other people. To me it's a day where people can kind of plug into that, um, can educate, there, there are people that are doing events, that are doing photo exhibits, that are uh, writing testimonials from trans folks about why pronouns matter to them, that are posting on social media using various hashtags like pronouns day uh, 19. Um, and so there's a lot of things we'll see on social media, but there's a lot of local events. Um, there are churches, colleges, businesses um, that are putting out information tables on the day of um, we have hundreds of endorsing organizations right now. And so if you are, you know, whether you're an individual and you just want to register for more information or you're an organization or a church or a group um, that wants to endorse the campaign, you can do that on pronounceday.org. You can also find a lot of these examples um, as well as materials that you can use like posters, um, logos, things that you could, could help you to develop what you want to on the local level. Some folks are doing workshops, they're doing a pronouns and pizza kind of event like we're doing here at University of Maryland, um, just like a common chat and let's talk about this topic further. 
Um, for others, it's a more formalized thing. So we'll see. It's really gra meant to be grassroots and what that people want to make of it in their locality, in their country, in their context. Um, and we know that like we can't generate the resources that will make sense for every single local context. So we just want to empower people to um, think about what's going to work um, for them in their locality. Thank you so much. And um, I think Antonio is going to get the uh, website in the comments so people will have that available for them. There was, um, and I, I was just thinking about the comment that was made, and um, to me it's not just about educating, it's also like developing good practices and what you think makes sense to your context and what you can offer. And so I'd say there are a lot more specific things that educators can do aside from just a workshop on pronouns. We can think about where pronouns appear. And whenever you're introducing someone or somebody is being introduced for the first time, might we want to consider pronouns at least as an option offered that people can share their pronouns there so for example um, newsletters and magazines on bylines do people want to include their pronouns staff listings on websites do people want to include their pronouns the marker that you put outside your door that has your name on it if you have an office a business card if you have a business card the name tags that volunteers and church members and board members and so on uh, where do they want to include their pronouns and at least proactively offering that option to people um, even if not everybody understands or wants to take that up there's a lot of places where we're not even trying yet and that's that's the opportunity I think in this is that it's not only about you need to learn and understand something but what can we also do thank you um, so we're coming up to the top of the hour. Is there any any message that you haven't gotten to say yet <laughs> that you want to make sure that you work in or any last words that you want to leave us with? Wow. Um, I think um, just uh, I think I've said a lot. <laughs> um, I hope that people will will really just kind of um, you know, talk to people locally and really start to think more proactively. You know, trans folks and non-binary folks in particular, non-binary folks are maybe about a third of all um, trans people um, and sometimes struggle the most because many of us do go by they, them, or zizir or some other set of pronouns that people may really struggle with. And, and, um, and that's really a struggle for us I think when we then get misgendered or mispronounced or people make assumptions in language, um, there's a lot of other things people can think about beyond pronouns. They can think about when they use terms should, you know, why might saying ladies and gentlemen or brothers and sisters be also things that also often happen in spiritual spaces. Um, how, how can that be impacting people? And we're not a huge percentage of the population but it can really impact the experience and whether somebody really wants to come back to a space. So I think it's, I would just really encourage people to um, certainly do your research, look online, um, find videos and, and all that, but also talk to people locally. Um, pe you may not have um, enough out trans people to have a really a conversation that is, is from and centered by trans people on what you need to do or do differently but you have resources like trust or you have, um, you know, people that you can go to that have an organizational role in UUA. Um, so utilizing all of these resources, I think is super important um, and connecting with the local community, but realizing that people may not be willing to come out, let alone come back um, if they don't feel like it's a place where they can really bring their full selves. And so until we start doing some of these more proactive things, um, it's going to be hard to even have the conversation of w what else is it that we can do. And I'm sure some are like pretty much further in that process um, than others. But, um, you know, if, if folks are like, we haven't really had a, a meaningful conversation on the local level, like here's the opportunity to start that up. Yeah. And, and I'd highlight also what you said about, you know, resourcing those groups. It's like, you know, we, we often have resources that we're just not even aware of that could be helpful. We have churches where people can meet, um, you know, that they need to have meeting spaces, free meeting spaces. There's 
a lot of things that our congregations and our communities can be doing to, um, to actively resource um, these, these communities. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And um, I know that we will have all of the uh, links uh, linked up to this, to this uh, episode. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, next week on The View, we have uh, Catherine Clarenbach and Heather Petit, who are going to come and talk to us about um, centering the experiences of neurodivergent Unitarian Universalists. So be sure to join us next week, same time, same channel, same everything, and we hope to see you all then. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. That was it. Was All work? right. Oh, and we lost you again. And we always forget to tell the guests that they can to stay. Say do, you, do you want to end the recording, Antonia? Yes, I do. Um, mm.